as uh, the kid count in our congregation continues to grow and grow, I find myself having to wait longer and longer, and I'm loving it. I'm loving every moment. Let's, uh, let's pray one more time, if we could, as we approach God's Word and ask for the Holy Spirit to help us in understanding and applying its message to us. Oh, Lord, we recognize this morning that if we're going to understand what you speak to us, it's not going to be because we're smart enough. Certainly not going to be because we're godly enough. If we're to understand and to apply what you have revealed to us here in your holy, infallible, and errant word, Father, we, we're going to need the help of your Spirit. And so, God, we ask for that help now. And we thank you that you are quick to give it in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Lord, build your church on the foundation of your Son as we apply his word by the power of your Spirit. Guide us now as we ask and, and read in your word and, and guard us from error. Lord, we know we are prone to it. Uh, help us, Lord, uh, to, to see clearly. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Well, one of the things we learn very early in life is to identify contrast. We all do it. We, we learn to identify contrast. We're, we're taught, for instance, what opposites are. So we're working on this right now with our little toddler named Salem. Perhaps you've seen that little toehead bumbling around uh, here uh, on Sunday mornings and on Wednesday evenings. And we've got a great book that I guess we've stumbled upon, uh, and I want to recommend it to you. If you're a parent or a grandparent, it's called Let There Be Light. This is an opposites primer. Uh, and what it does is teach opposites by using examples from creation. So I thought we'd try a few this morning as we're uh, approaching a passage that's just rife with opposites and with contrast. Uh, let's, let's play, are you smarter than a toddler? Um, start with an easy one. We need your participation here to make this work, okay? So the opposite of day is... Nailed it. And we see a picture here with a scripture. God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. All right, this next one's trickier, especially with several kids on your lap because you've actually got to turn the book the other way. Uh, the, the opposite of above is? You got it, below. You guys are great toddlers. Uh, God established the clouds above and fixed securely the fountains of the deep. One more, last one. The opposite of wet is dry. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. So, what are we doing? <laughs> Why all this talk about opposites this morning? Well, well, today Jesus is about to show us what I'll call some kingdom contrast. He's about to hold out to us two very stark opposites, and their differences in virtually every dimension could not be more glaring. Let me invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Luke's Gospel, the 16th chapter. Luke 16. We'll pick up where we left off last week in verse 19. Luke 16, 19. And we'll uh, move through to the end of the chapter, Lord willing. If you're using our church Bibles, just for, for help with page number, that's page 823, Luke 16, beginning in verse 19. Let's read God's Word together. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off in Lazarus at his side. 
And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus, in like manner, bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed, in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. And he said, then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. This is God's word to us, his people. Now, the first character that Jesus introduces us to here in verse 19 is a nameless rich man. And Jesus wants us to see that this guy isn't just rich. This guy is loaded. We're talking filthy, stinking rich. How do we know that? Well, just look at his threads here. Verse 19, he's clothed in purple, which in that day was a pretty hard-to-get color. Purple was considered the color of royalty. Why? Well, because it was so darn expensive. The way that you would obtain a garment of purple at this time was by gathering up rare sea snails and crushing them and condensing them down into this purple oil, this purple dye, and it was exceptionally costly. He's wearing king's clothes. That's on the outside. Then we see here also in verse 19, he's wearing fine linen. Now, now, this fine linen is a reference to his undergarments, probably woven and imported from Egypt. What we're not talking about is the Walmart special on Fruit of the Looms. <laughs> this is not what's happening here. What's Jesus saying? From this guy's outward appearance, purple, all the way down to his skivvies, this guy has it all. He's got the best of the best. Not only that, but he feasted, we're told, verse 19, feasted, I love this word, sumptuously, over the top. It was a party every day. This phrase, to feast sumptuously, that's how the ESV renders the Greek, can also be translated, maybe your, uh, your translation said something like, he celebrated joyously every day. It was a party at this guy's house. You get the picture, right? I mean, it's pretty clear. This rich man is living a life of opulence with the very best that money can provide. Now, the next character that Jesus introduces us to could not be more different. He is the very picture of abject poverty. And yet, what's striking, what, what probably threw Jesus' hearers right, right, way off kilter, was that this rich man is nameless, but this wretched, pitiable, poor man has a name. Remember, names in this culture, in this day, were very significant. What's more, his name was quite significant. They called him, and Jesus called him, Lazarus which means translated, God has helped, or God is my help. Although if you're looking at him with the eyes of the world, you might be tempted to scoff at that. God helped you, Lazarus. But consider, consider the contrast here. Take this rich man's sumptuous feasting and revelry and compare it to Lazarus' desperate hunger. Hunger so severe, Jesus says, that he longed to eat the scraps, to, to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. That's hungry. 
but he's more than just hungry. We get this tragic, uh, tragic excuse me, and, and graphic, really, graphic picture of Lazarus being diseased. His body is covered with open, seeping, oozing sores. He's likely disabled. Look at verse 20. We see that he is, quote, laid at the gate of the rich man. By the way, the rich man's got a gate. That word laid is the Greek word balo. It, it literally means to be thrown down or to be cast. It's likely that Lazarus couldn't walk. He was just sort of dumped there as a wretched invalid who couldn't care for himself. We see the word moreover in verse 21, as if to say, as if Jesus is telling us, even worse, the dogs came and licked his open, seeping sores. It's quite a picture, isn't it? Suffice it to say, what we're not talking about here is your friendly neighborhood labradoodle. Dogs in Scripture refer to wild animals that would eat the scraps and would live on the, the periphery of civilization. Yet everything, this, this picture that Jesus is painting is quite stark, yet everything is about to pivot here. It's about to shift in verse 22. So you ask yourself, what happens here in verse 22? Well, death. Death happens. It's often been called the great equalizer. It comes for us and is no respecter of persons. Note there's, there's no mention of a burial for poor Lazarus. Probably couldn't afford one, if anyone even noticed. Body may have been just been scooped up and collected and, and, and dumped in the refuse pile outside the city. The rich man, however, pred predictably was buried, probably with much pomp and circumstance, Received a great eulogy, I would bet, about all that he accomplished and did. And yet look at this seismic shift that occurs as the veil between life and death is turned. This is, this is a great reversal. The guy who was on top of the world is now writhing in eternal anguish. And the man who was overlooked was not even worthy of basic pity. That man is now seated in honor in the halls of paradise. I mean, we're almost got whiplash, don't we, as we move from verse 21 to 22. This is such a stark contrast. Did you catch here the angelic escort? This is wild. Lazarus dies, doesn't even get a burial, but he gets a heavenly envoy sent to carry him safely and without delay to his eternal paradise. What an incredible picture this gives us of God's tender mercies toward his beloved saints, even in death. Although not a soul may have cared about Lazarus, God himself dispatches a host of celestial servants to bring him safely into his very presence. How's the psalmist put it? Many of you know this one, Psalm 116, verse 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. We should pause here for just a moment to acknowledge that many here in this room, some of, for some of us it's very fresh, know the sting of grief as those that we dearly love have passed and are no longer with us. Friend, if that's, if that's true of you as you continue to mourn a, lo a loved one who has died in Christ, take heart. This passage, among many in Scripture, teaches us from Jesus' own mouth, there is no such thing as soul sleep. There's no purgatory. It's absent from the pages of Scripture. That's a, that's a man's invention. Remember Jesus' words to that dying thief on the cross? What do you say to him? Today, today you will be with me 
in paradise. As the teaching of Scripture is crystal clear, to be absent from the tent of this body is to be present with, with God Himself, present with the Lord. And just look at how Jesus describes Lazarus being in paradise, being in, in, present with the Lord. Verse 22, he's at whose side? Like the big guy, Abraham, the father not only of the Jewish nation, the father of faith, Abraham, remember, believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Abraham is the picture of the faithful man here. Some translations put it this way. The ESV renders it. Verse 22, he's at Abraham's side. Many of your translations that you're familiar with might say Abraham's what? Yeah, some of you were waiting for that. He just wanted me to say bosom. Abraham's bosom. Now, interesting to note, this is the only time in all of Scripture that we see this term, Abraham's bosom, used. And boy, oh boy, is there all kinds of stuff written about this. There are some who take Abraham's bosom to actually be a technical term. That is a, like a geographical place for a compartment of Sheol. In the Old Testament, you're, you're probably familiar with that word. We see that term Sheol quite a bit. It's, it's the, the place of the dead, generally referring to the place of departed souls, Sheol. And, and the idea goes, as some Bible teachers and commentators would say, there are two compartments to Sheol. There's one compartment in the, the place of the dead, which was a place for torment. It's where the unfaithful souls would go. The other compartment was this one, referring to Abraham's bosom. Where do you get this, we say? And this is the only place in all the Scripture we see that reference to Abraham's bosom. Well, we see it in the, the Jewish Talmud and other rabbinic literature from uh, ancient Jewish uh, sources. There's another view the other predominant view out there is that Jesus is simply describing paradise here. So Abraham, the man of faith who believed God, who is in heaven, certainly, is, is at a place in paradise, and Jesus is not so much describing a technical term as in a, a, a compartment for Sheol, as he is just describing a positional term. Where is Lazarus? Well, he's where Abraham is. He's in paradise. He's, he's at Abraham's very side. Lazarus is, as it were, a guest of honor at the heavenly banquet. He's so loved. He's so comforted that we see this intimate picture of him where Abraham is in the very paradise of God, leaning as, as the, the uh, uh, disciple John did on, on Jesus' bosom. No. However you want to take this, Abraham's bosom term, it's at least that much. It's at least referring to paradise. That much is clear here from Jesus' teaching in Luke 16. But for our purposes today, we're not going to get any more into the, uh, into the splicing and dicing of, uh, of Old Testament Sheol. We simply want to see the enormous and eternal contrast between the destinies of these two men forever. Jesus tells us, verse 26, there is a gulf. There's a chasm. There is an unbreachable divide that separates these two souls. The unfaithful, consigned to torment, everlastingly, and the redeemed who will enjoy intimate fellowship with God in paradise forever. This is Jesus' teaching. Okay, as we consider this, what we see in, in Jesus' parable, by the way, is some people get all bent out of shape about whether this is a parable or not. Jesus doesn't use the word parable here. Uh, and, and the whole rationale for it not being a parable is that there's a name given. The logic goes, well, there's no, there's no names in parables. I'm like, show me that verse. 
However you choose to classify this, the truth of Jesus' teaching is quite clear. And what's interesting to note is that we get our theology of hell almost exclusively from the Savior who came to rescue us from it. He's serious about this. And as he's describing Lazarus in eternal bliss at Abraham's side, that's really all he gives us. But do we get a whole lot more? Yeah, we do on the eternal plight of this nameless rich man. Two things, two true things, two chilling things which are painted quite clearly here. First, we see the fire of God's judgment portrayed. And secondly, we see the finality of God's judgment shown. First, the fire. Where is this rich man? Well, he's not resting in peace, is he? He's not consigned to merely some state of eternal loneliness. Now, this is Jesus' words, torment. This is agony. Four times. We see this four times. The words torment or agony in this short passage. Look at verse, excuse me, <coughs> excuse, uh, verse 23. In Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes. Verse 28, lest they come into this place of torment. The rich man describes where he is. Verse 25, here's Abraham's assessment. You received good things during your life, but now you are in anguish. Verse 24, he says it himself, I am in anguish in this flame. He's on fire in this flame. Is Jesus being serious? Yeah, eternally serious. The rich man cries out, anything, Abraham, any relief, even the slightest drop from the tip of your little finger. This, friends describes to us chillingly the very real, eternal, and conscious punishment that we see here and elsewhere portrayed in Scripture. I want to just make a quick side note. Jesus' teaching here in Luke 16 flies in the face of a false doctrine called annihilationism. Annihilationism is... The idea that, that those who are saved by grace through faith in Christ enjoy heaven forever, but because a loving God could never consign anybody to hell forever? Since they can't conceive of that, their explanation for it is, well, well those who aren't in Christ just eventually dissipate. They cease to exist. They're annihilated. That's not Jesus' doctrine of hell, is it? Just listen to how Scripture describes eternal judgment elsewhere. I'll just give you three. There's a ton of these. Listen to how Scripture describes the eternal plight of those who are not in Christ. 2 Thessalonians 1.9, where they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction. Mark 9, 47 and 48, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. This one takes the cake for me. Revelation 14, 10 and 11, describing the punishment of the unrighteous in eternity. The Apostle John writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. You've heard those snickers, right? Those jokes. Rather go to hell. At least I'll be with my friends. This is, this is not something to snicker about. What a foolish thing to say. It's torment, and it's eternal, and it's conscious. He's aware of it. Stop for a moment. I think 
Um, it would be wise for us to make a gospel comment here. Why is the rich man in eternal conscious torment here? In Hades, as Jesus calls it. Well, the rich man is in hell because he spent his life on himself. Like every human being born from Adam, he chose to put himself on the throne and not God. He sinned. And the wages of sin is death. It's this, eternal death. But what do we see on the other end of the chasm? This is, this is an important question. Why is Lazarus in paradise? Is it because Lazarus has been so good? It's curious to me that Jesus is entirely silent on Lazarus' character, isn't he? As a matter of fact, our boy Lazarus does not say a word. Again, the whole story. Not one word. There is not one thing said about a good deed that Lazarus did. Why is Lazarus in paradise? Because of his righteous deeds outweighing his bad deeds on these cosmic scales? No. He doesn't even speak. We, don't, we know nothing about him. All we get from Lazarus, from Jesus' mouth, is his desperation. That's all he tells us about. His need, his poverty, his helplessness. Now this is not to say that Lazarus is in heaven because he was poor. And all eternal life is, is a cosmic flip-flop. If you had it good in this life, you've got to come in in eternity. And if you had it bad in this life, well, you cash in in eternity. That's garbage. Think of all the examples in Scripture of wealth for those who are in the Lord. Abraham, exceedingly wealthy. Job, Joseph, King David, we could play all day. It's not that riches are bad. Just a couple weeks ago, Jesus is saying, use your mammon, use your worldly resources at your disposal and invest them for kingdom purposes. Guys, we don't get the full story of Lazarus' life because it's not the point. What Lazarus contributed to his eternal state was his need, it was his desperation. He's there because the grace of God took him there. And the angels were dispatched by a loving and perfect God to carry him to Abraham's side. What a contrast. The rich man, nameless, on top of the world. Was it worth it? No. Just, just send Lazarus to, to dip the tip of his finger. To soothe my anguish for a moment. Now, at this point, Jesus moves from the, the juxtaposition of their eternal plights and, and, and works his way through, focusing on the rich man in torment on two different appeals. We see the first appeal to, to Abraham in verses 24 to 26. That's what we've been talking about. What's he ask for? Relief. Just a, just a moment of respite, just a mere drop of water to cool his tongue. Abraham's answer? That's a hard no. There is, 26, verse, verse 26, a great chasm, that's what he says, fixed between us and you, which tells us that hell is not only a place of fire and torment, it's also a place of finality. There's no going back. No going back. When, when the rich man understands that there will be no hope, there will be no relief for him where he is in, in hell, he moves on to his second appeal. Isn't this interesting? This is 
the longest section here in the little story that Jesus tells us in Luke 16, verses 27 to verse 31. What's he say? If he can't get some relief, he says, again, always, always Lazarus. Send Lazarus, even in hell. This man is exalting himself over Lazarus. Send Lazarus to warn my brothers. I got five of them in my father's house. To warn my brothers not to come to this place of torment. Again, Abraham's answer, no can do. But but his rationale, Friendship Community Church, is so instructive for us. What's his why? Why is the answer no? What's he say? I beg you, verse 27, Send him to my father's house. I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, verse 29, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Period. We've been talking about Moses and the prophets quite a bit. What's that Bible speak for? That's just a way of saying the Old Testament all of the scriptures up to this point, the, the, the law, Moses, and the prophets, they've got God's revealed word. What's Jesus saying? They have scripture. That's enough. Lazarus says, come on. And he pushes back. He's arguing from hell. He doesn't have much of a leg to stand on, does he? He said to him, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is to come back from the dead, whew, and they'd listen to that, that'd snap them to attention, like a lightning bolt moment. And Abraham insists, if they do not hear, verse 31, Moses and the prophets, neither Will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead? What's what's this rich man saying? They need more! This dusty old book is not enough. Jesus begs to differ. They have, they didn't even have the New Testament yet. They've got the old covenant scriptures. They've got Moses and and the prophets that were designed to point to Jesus, the one who said, I have come to fulfill them. He is the consummation of the law and the prophets, the living, breathing, perfect word of God. They need something more. Now let's just pause for a minute. This isn't just the rich man's point of argumentation, is it? Sometimes we feel like this. Sometimes those we love feel like this. What I need from you, God, is more evidence. I need a supernatural sign. I need a lightning bolt moment. I need you to prove to me on my terms... That this thing is real. Surely, if I had a miracle like that, surely if I got that neon sign in the sky, I'd know it's real. Surely I would repent then. Remember that time in John chapter 12? This is fascinating to me. Jesus is praying. He's He's grieved. He's he's praying out loud to the Father. He says, John chapter 12, Father, glorify your name. And an audible voice from heaven, the very voice of God, claps through from the skies. And God the Father says, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. God spoke from heaven. And you know what the crowd said? The crowd that was there and heard it said that it had, you know, 
thundered. Now there's human nature. There's got to be some sort of physiological explanation for this. Just, just thunder, that's all that was. They heard God's voice from heaven. And still, in their hardness of heart, they rejected His truth. No, Abraham says in verse 31, they've got all they need. Scripture is sufficient. If they're not convinced of the truth of the law and the prophets, if they refuse to walk in the light that God has given them up to this point, this is so good. Even if someone should rise from the dead, now guess who that's going to be? They won't hear it. They won't see it. Friends, if you won't heed, if you won't hear God's word, then you're not going to heed, you're not going to hear the word made flesh. And that, Friendship Community Church, is what this whole story is all about. Jesus is pointing to himself. Jesus is talking about himself. He says, we know, Luke chapter 9, I'm going to come, I'm going to die. Jesus calls the bank shot before he makes it. You know, some of you who played horse back in the day. Luke 9, 22, he predicts his death. And his resurrection, like ahead of time. Luke 9, 22. The Son of Man, Jesus said, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And Easter's coming. On the third day, rise. No. Abraham says to the rich man, they won't believe even if the dead should rise again. And yet, he told them ahead of time what he was going to do. He made it about himself here in this fascinating story. But the God of all grace does more than that. The Old Testament is enough God's word is enough. Certainly the resurrection of Christ is everything. And yet, I I don't know, is he just smirking to himself in eternity? God also, in his mercy, grants this request too. Jesus did, in a way, send Lazarus, didn't he? But not a fictional character named Lazarus that we get here in Luke 16 in parabolic form. No, he's really going to do it. He's really going to send a man named Lazarus back from the dead. In John chapter 11, what's he do? This is his friend, his flesh and blood friend named Lazarus who's dead for four days. His sister says, don't open the... Don't open the grave, Lord. Decomposition has got to be setting in by now. You see the irony of what Jesus does? He raises Lazarus from the dead as an answer to this hypothetical question posed in this parable. He sends Lazarus back from the dead as a testimony to the truthfulness of his words, to the, to the truth of the gospel that he had come to herald and embody. But the hard-hearted brothers that Jesus was talking about of the rich man, did they listen? No. John twelve ten. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death again. Because on account of him, on account of Lazarus, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. In like manner, after Jesus himself had conquered fully and finally sin and death, the chief priests 
and the elders of the nation of Israel. Read the end of the Gospel of Matthew. They fabricate a story and they pay off the soldiers to say, yeah, well, we were asleep. They went and stole his body. It's time for us to talk about how this applies to our lives. But before we get to particulars, I just need to be faithful to ask you this question. Do you believe? Do you believe that God's word is true and that it points us to the only name under heaven by which men may be saved, the name of Jesus? The man who told this story walking to the cross at Jerusalem, who would trade his life for our sin and our shame and our death, who would buy us with his blood, purchase us, redeem us by his sacrifice on the cross and offer to us eternal life. Do you believe it? Jesus has just given you a snapshot image of the horrors of eternal separation from God in hell. I'm in anguish in this flame. And he has come so that you wouldn't go there. John 5, 24, Jesus speaking again. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. In a room this size, I can't see your soul but it is very likely that there is someone here or someone's here who have not surrendered their life and their eternity to Jesus Christ, who are not born again and saved eternally from their own sin and consequences before a holy and perfect God. Please. No pageantry needed. If you're here today and you believe his words and you believe that he died and rose again, come to him. You say to yourself, well, how do I do that, Zeb? Do I need to repeat a prayer after you? Do I need to walk down the aisle? Do I need to fill out a checkbox? How can I make sure that this thing takes there's nothing wrong with a prayer. There's nothing wrong with a raised hand. There's nothing wrong with a walk down the aisle. But that's not in Scripture. None of that is in Scripture. How can you know that you'll be there? You believe. So believe. Like, before I finish this sentence, you can be saved. You don't need to wait for me to pray for you for crying out loud. Believe! That Jesus rose from the dead. And you will be saved. It's a good gospel. He's a good Savior. All right. Let's button it up with some things that we, we can take away. Let's, let's, like James exhorts us to be doers of this word, not just hearers of it. What do we do? It's 2024 with the rich man and with Lazarus. Well, the first thing we ought to do is come to grips with the sufficiency of Scripture. If you're here and you don't believe or you're wrestling with belief, what you do not need is more evidence. You need to believe the evidence that God has given you. Jesus Christ is God, very God. He died and rose again. And if you place your faith and trust in Him, you will be saved. You don't need anything more than that. You want to talk. You want to pray. You, you want to work through this. I, our elders would love nothing more. <laughs> Grab somebody here and, and start that conversation. 
Scripture is sufficient because it points to the only Savior, and His name is Jesus. If you're here today, and you're a believer, many of you are here, that's why you're here, you're coming to worship this Jesus who bought you with His blood. If you're a believer, you need to hear this too. Scripture is sufficient. You don't need anything more than the gospel to tell your friends. This guy says, when he realizes it's too late for himself, oh no, tell my brothers. Interesting enough, from the guy in hell, that is precisely the faithful response. What's it look like for you to tell your brothers? To tell your family, to tell your friends out of love and compassion that God so loved them. The world, humanity, that he sent his only son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. You don't need more than the gospel, friends. Some of us are paralyzed to evangelize. We're paralyzed to share the gospel. What if they ask me a question and I don't know the answer? Welcome to the club. <laughs> of course you don't know all the answers. Neither do I. And if you got somebody who's pretending that he does, walk away. God has the answers. Jesus is the answer. You don't need to have a PhD in theology or a, a, a job in ministry or some sort of expertise or X amount of years or deeds under your belt before you can faithfully share Jesus. Scripture is sufficient. You don't need the answers. You share the gospel and trust the one who has them to work it out. Second simple application, we're going to just whip through these like a drive-by. I'll pose it in terms of a question. Are you yearning for paradise? We've got a slide here for this one. I'm just going to flash these scriptures up on the screen. We're not going to belabor them or work through them. I just want... If you believe this, that Lazarus' condition was better than the rich man's condition. What did Corey read just a moment ago? Rather have one day in your courts, Lord, than a thousand anywhere else. Romans 8, 18, we just blitz them. For I consider that the present sufferings of this time are not worth comparing. Don't even put them in the same sentence with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Exhibit A, Lazarus. Philippians 3, 20 and 21. But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it, heaven, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly bodies to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. There's so many. You knew I was going to tell you know I was going to give you Psalm 1611. I love this one. In his presence, the psalmist writes, in, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. It was worth it. As extreme as Lazarus' suffering was, as extreme, friend, as your hardship and sufferings have been, they don't even compare. They pale in comparison to the glory that will be revealed. Are you longing for eternity? Are you comforting yourself as you're, as you're struggling with the hardship and the, the pressure and the turmoil of life? Because you're a citizen in heaven. All right, application number three. This one's a bit more gritty. It's very boots on the ground. Do not be a respecter of persons. I think we see this in this passage, don't we? Things are not always as they appear to the natural eye. You know, some of the most precious saints who will be exalted in heaven may be people that you are tempted to overlook and barely give a notice to. Are you drawn, friend, 
to power, to prestige. Sure you are, and so am I. Resist it, Christian. Let me show you. I shared just a, a brief time how uh, I blew it. I've got plenty of these stories. I was just getting into ministry, pastoral ministry, as a younger man, and I was in a meeting. And uh, at this meeting was a very important person that I thought a lot of, uh, a very important person who had a position of prestige in the church. And I thought, man, I don't get a lot of opportunities like this. And we were talking, there were you know, a table full of people in this meeting, and um, the, the meeting wraps up, and a good friend, this, is a, this was a good friend, pulled me aside after the meeting and looked me right in the eyes and said, what are you doing? It's like, what? <laughs> Lay off me. What, what's wrong? What was that? You in that meeting. You must have looked at that guy at the head of the table a hundred times. Every time after you said something, which was quite a lot, Zeb, you would look to him as if for approval. What are you doing? Why are you trying so hard to impress this guy? And I thought, guilty. Because in that moment, it's a ministry meeting. We're talking about the church and, and the Lord. Uh, what I was most concerned with was impressing this guy to elevate myself. And I had done it imperceptibly in my heart. I didn't even know I was doing it. Do not be, Christian, a respecter of persons. It may be that some of the most precious saints you have ever known or met look remarkably unremarkable in the eyes of this world. Last application. If we're going to be faithful after reading a text like this, I hope this is obvious, we must, Friendship Community Church, give ourselves to the work of evangelism. We must give ourselves to the work of missions and to the work of discipleship. Do we really understand the weight of eternity? Well, if we do, then, then we better love our neighbors and our friends enough to compel them to follow Jesus. Trisha Gottschalk was speaking yesterday at the women's brunch, and her topic was, going through the armor of God in Ephesians 6, shoes fitted around feet as the readiness of the gospel of peace. One of the ways we advance the gospel is to strap on gospel shoes and advance to go out with the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news. Isaiah says it. Paul says it. May we here at FCC have beautiful feet. It just takes seeing the gospel clearly and asking the Lord to work it more fully in our souls. I invite you to stand and as we sing a declaration of that truth now. What is our hope in life and death? Christ alone. Christ alone. What is our only confidence? That our souls to Him belong. Let's, let's pray. Father, we love You and we thank You for Your Word. Lord, we thank You that You love us enough to tell us the truth, to warn us of the wrath to come and to send Your very Son to rescue us from ourselves from the wrath we justly deserve. Lord, all we have is Jesus, your Son, and we thank you that he's enough. We pray, Lord, that you would guard us from the things of this world that vie so viciously for our attention and affection. 
Lord, may we not be like the rich man, living lives of comfort here and totally unaware of what that means for eternity, God. Give us the right posture, the gospel posture. We know that in Christ we have everything needed for life and godliness. Now, Lord, as we sing to Christ, the one who rose from the grave, we pray that we would, we would sing with heart, soul, mind, and strength, Father, because, Jesus, we know you're alive and you hear us. We pray these things now in your name. Amen.